traditional Judaism, which at first glance does indeed have an enormous amount of, of conflict. Uh, the, the first obvious case of, of conflict in, in this, in this uh, situation is that in the holy book of the Jew, which is known as the Torah, or the Bible, um, which is essentially the book that the Jewish people uh, have always lived by, uh, given to the Jewish people as they were encamped around Mount Sinai approximately 3,300 years ago. The Jewish, Jewish tradition has it. It was given to the Jewish people by God, by the creator of the universe, and that every word, all the nuances and all the multi levels of meanings that are contained within there are God's message to the Jewish people. <clears throat> so the problem that that presents with a, a message that God gave to the Jewish people is when, in light of modern science, if there are conflicts, what are you supposed to do about that? So a particularly strong example of what might appear to be a conflict is in the opening lines of the Torah. It describes how the world, the whole universe, was created in six days, and of course on the seventh day, God rested. And according to Jewish tradition, this event took place, or at least the culmination of this event, took place approximately 5,750 or so years ago. So this presents an obvious problem to anybody who has the least amount of familiarity with modern science, and that, and that uh, look, they're saying the world is 15 billion years old, or, or whatever the numbers are these days, 10 billion, 15 billion, something like that. So there's an obvious problem right off the bat, which was a problem which I was extremely aware of. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, some people see this as an example of compatibility uh, between science and Judaism, in the sense that uh, the way that many Jews interpret uh, some of these uh, lines in the Torah is that they're not meant to be interpreted in their strict literal sense. Rather, they're interpreted as containing some sort of outline of what the idea is, but there's a deeper message hidden within it. <laughs> so in this particular case, for instance, if you deal with the, the, uh, the six days of creation, as it's known in, in the, the Torah uh, framework, what are we to do about that? So in general, the way people who are interested in making some sort of um, compatibility between science and Judaism, what they would say is the world, the creation of the universe took place in six stages. And these six stages are represented by the six days of creation. The culmination of these six stages was the, the, the whole point of creation, namely the creation of human beings. And the first human being was created or put in the position of having a human soul in which, in which that, those human beings could interact with God, that event took place 5,757 years ago. So, in put in light in that regard, it's not all that far off from the way modern science might look at it. Namely, that human beings, as, as, as in the civilized form that we know them to be, took place approximately 6,000 years ago. And the creation of the universe took place in a period of six stages or so. And the time period for these six stages are vague. Was it billions of years or millions of years? Whatever it might have been, that is anybody's guess. The Torah, by and large, is not viewed as a science book. It's not meant to be a textbook that will teach a person how to do biology or how to do physics or mathematics or whatever. Whether or not one can glean anything of, of the sciences from the Torah than another volume, but it's not meant to be a textbook. And therefore, when it comes to a basic questions such as the age of the universe and how did it come about, and basic scientific questions, the Torah is not really the place where one would look for that. <laughs> the Torah is focusing on a completely different idea, it's focusing on what is the purpose of our creation, what is the purpose of our, of our existence here, and how are we to learn to relate to God. How science might fit into there, science is also a means of, of God interacting with the earth. God runs the world through science, through nature, and that is another way that God speaks to us. The Torah is essentially telling us that the way God has given us instructions in terms of our interactions with our fellow human beings, our interactions with the world, our interactions with God, 
in some way or another, these interactions also have to comply with the rules of science. And that if in some way or another they don't fit in the rules of science, well then something has to give, something just won't work. <coughs> so as far as the general question of compatibility, most people do not have problems of compatibility of the Torah with science, because the two are looked at as almost like uh, two things that are sort of passing each other by and not necessarily uh, meeting each other head on. <coughs> so, so the conflict that might appear to be there can always be sort of worked out. As far as science mentioned in the Torah itself, by and large, there is no science mentioned in the Torah other than the description of creation and certain histories that are described. The only thing that we remotely remember, uh, remotely resemble science is a certain disease that plays a somewhat significant role in Torah Judaism, a disease which appears to resemble the disease known as leprosy. <clears throat> the only difference is leprosy is a, is a biological disease due to, I don't even know what it's due to, some sort of infection possibly, I don't know what it's due to, but uh, the, the disease mentioned in the Torah, which is described quite recently, <coughs> is viewed not as a uh, biological disease, rather than viewed as a spiritual disease. Mainly due to a spiritual defect in a person's character, the disease will affect them physically. In general, this is the way that Torah, that Torah Judaism meets science. Where science ends in describing the physical universe, that's where Torah starts, in describing the spiritual universe. And the two are meant to complement each other. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Father Jim Reed. Um, I'm a Jesuit priest, uh, a professor here at Santa Clara University. I've been here since 1975. And uh, I teach courses generally around the area of the uh, Christian origins and the history of Christian spirituality. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit different than uh, my colleagues here today in that I don't have a uh, a church where I am uh, serve as pastor or associate. Uh, I am a professor. However, I do go out uh, regularly to churches and uh, assist in the local community, particularly the uh, parish of the Queen of Angels in Cupertino. Uh, and then also I uh, have the privilege of presiding at liturgies here at uh, Santa Clara University in the Mission Church. But my primary work is uh, study and teaching. Uh, before I, I uh, begin and address the questions, I'd like to really thank the Muslim Students Association for organizing, arranging uh, these opportunities for us to get together. Uh, I think that it is a, a wonderful thing that they do, and it allows uh, us as well to uh, come to a better understanding of each other and to share that with all of you here. So, uh, great gratitude to the uh, Muslim students here at Santa Clara. I would agree with uh, many things uh, that Rabbi Meyer has said. Um, when uh, I look particularly at the second question, is uh, any science mentioned in your holy book or tradition? Well, it all depends, of course, on what we mean by science. Uh, there was a time in uh, Christianity, of course, when we would say, yes, there is science, there is science. Yeah. In, uh, in the uh, Roman tradition, the Latin tradition, which simply means knowledge. What kind of knowledge is there? Is there understanding? But that term science has really come to be understood in a very particular way today. And uh, in the, uh, uh, agreeing with uh, Rabbi Meyer, in the way that it's understood today, there is nothing about science in the Bible, either in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, uh, which of course are uh, uh, part of our holy book, uh, as well as the uh, Christian scripture. Um, science, uh, I think as we see it, uh, is really a defined set of methods. And these methods are either hypothetically deductive, meaning that they attempt uh, to understand the natural processes, the physical, the biological, the uh, chemical, and cosmological universe. Or the science can also uh, use historical methods. 
And there they attempt to understand biological, chemical, geological, and cosmological history of the Earth and ultimately of the universe. So in this sense, the Bible doesn't uh, try to use these kinds of hypothetical or uh, strictly scientific historical methods. The science, uh, the, the Bible, as uh, in our tradition, as uh, Rabbi said, uh, really tells us about God and God's relationship to the world and the universe. It answers, in a way, a much more important question to us, ultimately, about our lives. Who are we? How are we with God? Uh, who are we with each other in light of our relationship to God? And God is our creator. God creates the world as good. Um, we can then find God in this good world by paying attention to it, taking it seriously, studying it. And, and by doing so, we will come to understand the goodness of uh, this uh, world created by God, and that will point us towards goodness itself and who is God. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, uh, of which I'm a part, uh, we speak of this as the principle of sacramentality. That means that everything that is, is in some way a visible sign and also a bearer of God's presence and action in the world. And so, paying attention to that, studying that, can bring us closer to the God who is present and to the God who is active. Uh, in a sense, then, there's no strictly um, uh, secular science. Uh, science itself can be a means of understanding who God is and how God acts. With regard to the interpretation of uh, the scripture, it has been, uh, you know, Christians have found themselves all over the place in that uh, throughout the centuries. At times, there, there was a conflict between science and religion, and for some denominations of Christianity today, there uh, continues to be a, a sort of conflict uh, between the two. Um, but in the, the Catholic tradition, certainly, uh, we do not see any conflict between the two because one tells us about the much more important ultimate questions of our relationship with God and the other uh, helps us understand the physical universe. I think I'll leave it. All right. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, uh, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, I, I think um, it's very tempting, being the third after two, to kind of look at some of the things that were said before me, but I'm going to attempt to resist that right? temptation, <laughs> which is part of religion, right? Resisting temptation. Uh, I think I would say initially uh, what uh, Father Wright said about the idea of defining science. Modern science, uh, as it's being practiced in the West and really now all over the world, I think is deeply incompatible uh, with uh, the Islamic teaching. And I would say that because of the results that it produces. In other words, from a Muslim perspective, there are certain limits and boundaries which are very clearly defined in the Quran about human behavior. And the idea of transgressing those boundaries is considered a transgression against God and against God's order. In terms of is Islam incompatible with science, if we define science as truth, then absolutely not. It would have to be in harmony with science because the Muslim belief is that Islam is from the truth. In fact, one of the names of God is Al-Haq, which means the truth. And therefore, what comes from God must be true. And also, given that God has made us rational creatures and creatures that use the intellect, what God has told us about God and about God's creation must be understood through the intellect. If the intellect cannot understand it, 
then this would be unfair on God's part to give us an intellect and then to give us things deeply incongruous with the intellect's understanding and force us to believe those things, going against what our own intellects uh, tell us is true. Now, here you move into another problem, which is what if the intellect is not capable of discerning the truth? Because we are deeply self-delusional creatures. Human beings can uh, delude themselves to believe the most incredible things. Uh, to give an example, uh, somebody once took uh, an astrolog- astrological chart of a, a, murder, a murderer in, uh, in France, and it was saying, what a wonderful person, you're intelligent, you're clever, you're witty, uh, you're deeply compassionate towards other human beings. And this man had killed like about 50 people, and he sent it to several different people, put an ad in the newspaper, and said, free horoscope, sent to this address, and he got letters back telling people that they hadn't believed in astronomy, astrology before that, but when they got this thing, they said it, it so fitted their personality that, that it must be true. So the point being is that uh, we, we can delude ourselves into believing many, many things. So then what then is the criterion for belief? Now from the, the Muslim perspective, I think we need to divide science uh, into uh, two basic areas, and one would be what, what would be a formal system. And a formal system of science deals with proof, and it deals uh, with axioms and proof. So you have an axiom, and then you prove uh, something based on your axioms, like geometry would be a, a good example of a formal system. Now, the nature of formal scientific systems is that they don't deal with content. In other words, geometry will never uh, tell you why something, uh, why a, a point Uh, is that which has no uh, depth or breadth, or why a circle is equidistant, and and whatever the scientific definition that geometry gives us, it will not tell us why. So it does not go into what what, uh, would be termed a structural system, which begins to look at content and to explain content. From a Muslim perspective, uh, Muslims are uh, notorious historically for accepting formal systems. Uh, geometry, astronomy, are formal systems that measure things. Many of the Muslims were great, great astronomers. Al-Khawarizmi, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians that ever lived, uh, developed the logo rhythm, which is actually logo rhythm, is from his name, Al-Khawarizmi, which in Latin was al logarithm That's how it was interpreted. Uh, we know Omar Khayyam, the famous, who's known in the West for his poetry. He's not known in the East for his poetry. He's known in the East for his mathematical computations. Uh, he developed a very precise and exact calendar. So the point is, is that within formal systems, the Muslims have never had a problem. Where they, where they have a problem is when you move into structural systems, which is explaining content and no longer describing form. Because science can either describe something, it can prove something, or it can explain something. When it describes something, it's simply descriptive science, anatomy, physiology. You can just describe the anatomy of a liver. When you move into a, uh, a system which then begins to explain uh, the, the function of a liver or the purpose of a liver, you can have a hypothesis. And the hypothesis might be valid or it might be invalid, depending on the data that's collected and all of these things. So from the Muslim perspective, when you begin to explain things in which you have really no arena or no, uh, no real grounding in that explanation, then the Muslims would say, no, you have transgressed your boundaries. You are not allowed to venture into this area. And certainly, for instance, uh, in, the, in the modern world, uh, what's happening now with genetic uh, altering that's going on, we just, if, if the report is true, I mean, we, we obviously have to wait and see exactly what's happened, but if the report is true that in Scotland they have cloned a sheep, well, from the Muslim point of view, this is a transgression. It's a, it's a gross transgression. From the Western uh, scientific point of view, it is not. It is another step in the progress of mankind, that we have moved another step closer to more exact knowledge about the world we're living in. The Quran says, do not change the creation of God. That's a village of Khalqibla. Do not change the creation of God. That is a command for the Muslims. And it is in the, the imperative form in the Arabic language. Do not change the creation of God. 
And it says in the Quran that the devil will encourage human beings to change the creation of God. And the devil says, They will change the creation of Allah. They will alter the creation of God. So the Muslims see this as a gross transgression. And therefore, this type of science, which has been separated from the sacred, is unacceptable from a Muslim perspective. The Muslim sees the scientist as a believer, first and foremost. And that when the scientist is divorced from belief and from the moral and ethical boundaries of the Islamic tradition, then the Muslim sees that scientist as a transgressor. And so, there is no doubt that the Muslims would, would say that science, that the Quran encourages science. The Quran, many, many verses in the Quran tell us not just to, to reflect on theological issues, reflect on scientific issues. And uh, in answer to is there science in our uh, text, the, the Quran has many, many verses directly related to science. And Maurice Bocail, the French scientist, has uh, very clearly articulated in several books that uh, the interesting thing to note about the Quran is unlike the, uh, the Torah and the New Testament, that the Quranic uh, scientific statements are consistent with, uh, with modern science. And modern science, I mean by their, uh, what they have shown to us to be true. For instance, in the Quran, uh, it says, أَفَرَمْ يَنْظُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Haven't they looked at the heavens and the earth? And then it says, كَانَتْ رَسْقًا فَفَسَقْنَاهُمَا They were bound together, and we, and the word that's used, فَتَقْنَاهُمَا, means we exploded them. Uh, Fatak in Arabic is a hernia. It's, a, it's an explosion of breaking out of boundaries. And then it says, And then from water we created every living thing. Now here is a, 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 a Quranic verse that is, is very uh, consistent with uh, the modern uh, theory of the beginning of creation. And what's interesting for the Muslim is, is that this, the Big Bang theory was forced upon the scientific community. I mean, there's a lot of people that would like to say it's kind of Christian scientists have, you know, no. They had a big problem with it initially because they did not want to admit the idea that the, the universe was not eternal. And in fact, Einstein, uh, in his initial general theory of relativity, in his initial equation, what, what he discovered was that they actually indicated an unstable universe. It, that, in other words, mathematically, it either had to be expanding or contracting. And that bothered him so much that he put corrective equations in there to make it stable so that he could say that the universe was eternal. And he later admitted that that was a mistake because the scientific evidence did indicate that, in fact, the universe is, is unstable. The, uh, unstable. Edwin Hubble uh, discovered that the universe, in fact, is expanding. And, the, uh, and now, which the research was done right down here in Stanford with the backdrop radiation coming into the Earth, which were the uh, effects of the original explosion of the Big Bang. So the Quran very clearly uh, makes that uh, statement about the universe and in fact says, uh, And the heavens we have created with power. And we are expanding them quite very clearly in Arabic language, and we are expanding them. Uh, in the, the 5th century, 6th uh, century uh, commentator on the Qur'an, who, uh, uh, Ibn Atiyah, he was an Andalusian from Spain, said that this must mean somehow that the universe is growing now. This is, I mean, this is 6th century, a scholar being forced to look at the, the, the language and what it was saying and to take it literally. And he had no evidence for that. Now it's interesting that St. Thomas Aquinas in, in the Middle Ages said that it is only through belief that we believe, it is only through faith that we believe that the universe had a beginning because it cannot be proven. And this was the position of the Catholic Church because the Greek philosophers said no, it was eternal. So here uh, within the Quran itself, no, it tells us that the universe is created and gives us a very interesting description of how it actually took place. It also talks about the big crunch, which is, uh, the Quran says very clearly that as we, as we have spread out the universe, so we will roll it up. And the, also the uh, anthropic meltdown of, uh, of the universe is described very clearly in the Quran. It says that the uh, earth in the end of time will boil over, that the water will literally boil over, and that there will be uh, uh, heat everywhere. And this is what they call the great heat down uh, of the universe when uh, 
the, the nature of entropy is that heat is, is moving out to a, a, a constant state, and this is a uh, heat meltdown for the universe. This, again, is in the Quran. The Quran has very uh, clear descriptions of embryology. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad was once asked, uh, what determines the male or the female? And he said there is a race between the male the water, this is his language of the 7th century, the male water and the female water, and the one that gets there first. And he said quite literally, يَتَسَعَبَ مَا الْأُنْتَوِي وَمَا الْزَكَرِ They will race by uh, the, the, the water of the male and the water of the female, and the one that gets there first will determine what it is. Now we know the X and the Y chromosome, uh, now, the X is the female chromosome, the Y is the male chromosome, and the one that gets there first will determine uh, whether the child is a male or a female. The Prophet Muhammad said uh, when he broke his fast, he used to break it on uh, dates, which is sugar, dates is, is fructose. And he said, uh, uh, Oh God, my thirst has been quenched and my veins have been soaked. My veins have been soaked with uh, nutrients, with sugar. And you can do a, if you do a glucose test on a fasting person, uh, at the instant that the sugar gets to the tongue, you can do a stick test and blood sugar goes up immediately because there's an uh, immediate dispersion of glucose uh, within the body. It's almost instantaneous. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad also, we uh, learn in school that Thomas Harvey discovered the circulation of blood. Uh, Ibn Nafis, who was a, preceded him by about 600 years, talked about the circulation of blood. But we also have a tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, Inna shaytan yajri fitni adam najari adam. Shaytan, Satan, flows in the body of Adam through the flowing pathways of the blood. Right? And the, the, the dominant belief was that blood was stationary, it was not moving in the body. And he clearly articulated the movement. And I'm, I could go on because there really are extraordinary scientific uh, uh, explanations in the Quran of many, many things. Uh, and in fact, Keith Moore, who is a, uh, a very well-known embryologist who's written the textbook that is used in several universities in the United States, when he wrote about the history of embryology, saying that it, there was no history until the microscope was discovered, and uh, somebody actually in uh, Arabia wrote him a letter saying, you're quite wrong. The Quran mentions very specific details about embryology. Keith Moore took it quite seriously and looked into it and found in fact, and he actually has stated in his most recent edition of his book on embryology, which is used at the UCLA Medical School, that the Quranic description of the uh, embryonic uh, creation of the, the fetal cells and the movement towards a complete fetus is consistent with what we know in modern embryology and it would have been impossible for a human being to have that knowledge in the 7th century by other than some type of intuition uh, or insp divine inspiration. And he said, and, and I have no other explanation for it. So I, with that, I think I'll just end by John too. Um, I have a, uh, a question for, um, I don't know if I'm going to name right now, for the Imam. Hamza, yeah. <laughs> um, when you uh, said that um, the science uh, that sort of treads on, on the ground that it really has no business doing so, it is transgressive. Um, for instance, in the case of the, uh, the cloning, I think would be a, a good example of that. Which, uh, Judaism also might come to a, a similar conclusion. <laughs> Yet you also said that, that science is viewed as a, a form of truth and therefore has to be compatible with the truth that is expressed in the Quran. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what I'm getting at is, can, can truth be wrong? If it's a transgression to tamper with this, this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then um, 
but it's true. They, they did it. They, they, they cloned this sheep, and and they're probably going to keep on cloning more sheep or or whatever. Who knows what they're going to pull? People. people. They want people. People. They, they, they want people. Yeah, exactly. So um, so so if it works, then I believe you would agree to this, that there's some element of truth there. There's there's something real and true about it. It's not fake. So um, so. How do you reconcile the two, that the, the truth of science, but the fact that it goes against what perhaps could be perceived as the truth expressed by Islam? Well, I, 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 there's some kind of, for me, in what you're articulating, there's, there's some uh, basic flaw here that, I, that I'm seeing is that, for instance, it is true that a, a gun uh, is fired into the human heart, a 38 caliber. Uh, will definitely kill that uh, person, but but that doesn't mean that you know to do it is truth or to do it is in fact you know the idea of the, the science that is enabling people to do these things might certainly be based on demonstrable proof uh, and demonstrable truth, but that does not mean that the actions that subsequently result from that knowledge are true or are uh, are worthy of doing. Uh, do you see what I mean? In other words, I think that, uh, you know, if we can uh, genetically uh, alter things, if we can genetically clone things, that the knowledge that has enabled us or empowered us to do that is a type uh, of truth. I mean, it's either true or it's false. If it's true, uh, then, then it will be consistent, right, with, uh, with what we know and uh, what we're able to do with it. But I don't think that that knowledge itself uh, is a permission to transgress boundaries. In other words, I might uh, know something uh, to be true uh, in, in relation just to cause and effect in the world, but it's true that if I punch somebody that that creates a certain effect on that person. But the action itself is divorced from the truth of my knowledge of what, the, what happens when the action is done. So, the, you know, I think it's very important to separate the idea of knowledge itself and, and the knowledge that we have and what we do with that knowledge. Do you see what I mean? I, I think you're saying there, there's an objective truth. They can call it sheep. That's a fact. That's well, I don't know if it is a fact. Oh, assuming yeah. assuming, it's, assuming it's, it's, they did it. Assuming they yeah. did it, yeah. That's an objective truth. But there's, in a certain sense, there's a different type of truth. A, 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 you might call it a religious truth or a, or a moral truth that says, what are we to do with, the, with this knowledge? What are exactly. we to do? Should we use it and, and, and try to make more sheep or more human beings or this, more whatever? This is the point. And the Prophet uh, Muhammad said, Oh God, uh, I ask you for useful knowledge and I seek refuge in you from harmful knowledge. Because truth, as we know proverbially, is a double edged sword. It can work for us or it can work against us. And it's very dangerous because when it's in the hands of people that really have no moral uh, grounding, and many scientists don't, and I think a scientist that could develop napalm uh, does not have a moral grounding, and yet we have research scientists in this country that work in defense that uh, work on developing more and more sophisticated weapons to destroy human beings. The Prophet Muhammad forbade us to kill with fire. We cannot kill another human being with fire. It is prohibited in Islam. And by analogy, the Muslim scholars have said that nuclear uh, bombing is a type of killing people with fire, and that is impermissible. Now, the Catholic Church, interestingly enough, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, one of the popes declared that the crossbow was an unethical form of killing another human being. <laughs> in other words, they, they did have a concept that, you know, Somebody could argue, well, what's the difference between a crossbow and shooting it with an arrow, right? <laughs> you know, you're killing the person. Well, the idea was that, that, that there's some nobility when, when men go out to fight. There, there is a nobility in, 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 in how we fight. There was a, a general in the Pentagon who, when the Iraqi, uh, they found out that there were 8,000, 8, by their own uh, admittance, there were 8,000 soldiers that were buried alive. Um, with bulldozers, uh, this uh, Pentagon, the general said, uh, there's no noble way to kill people, right? 
Well, I would totally disagree, and I think the, the samurai warrior would certainly disagree, because part of their training was to learn the, the, the art of, of fighting nobly, that there is a way that human beings act within each other, even when we go to war together. And I know that the, uh, that, uh, the, the Christian tradition certainly has a rule that relates to, in, their, in their canon of rules of war, that relates to fighting uh, nobly. Um, and I know that also the Jewish tradition has laws that relate to war also. So I think, you know, the point is, yes, that we do have knowledge and we can do extraordinary things with that knowledge, but, you know, where do we go with it? What permission do we have? You know, and, and, and I think probably the most dangerous thing for, for me about uh, genetic cloning is this, we go back to eugenics, this is Hitler. I mean, this goes back to who decides what is a deformity and what, you know, who decides how we, uh, you know, we clean up the gene pool? Who decides what, what are inferior genes that we don't want to have out there? And we've got people saying that, uh, that black people uh, are at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, positively skewed end, right, or negatively skewed end of the bell curve, uh, that they're inferior people uh, through intelligence. Well, maybe we don't want in inferior people around. You know, maybe we should uh, look at the genes that make them inferior and we can eliminate those from the gene pool. I mean, we do have knowledge, but how are we going to use this knowledge? Right. I, I can't help but, uh, but think about uh, the noble warrior, uh, I'm a Star Trek fan. I can't help uh, but think of the Klingon warp, who, uh, uh, the, the paramount thing is, uh, is to fight and to die nobly, and every day is a good day to die. Uh, that is better that we, we not fight and that we not uh, kill each other in the first place. Uh, I agree the the, uh, the issue of cloning and what it points towards uh, uh, is exactly that. We can have knowledge. We have. Uh, uh, possibilities in science and technology to do things, but should we do them? Uh, should we use this, uh, this knowledge and this science? What does it lead us toward? What kind of people does it make us into? Or how is it congruent with being a child of God, being made in the image of, and likeness of God? Uh, so the whole issue of this Tony is really, I think, fraught with ethical and, and moral questions. Um, what do we become when we use this kind of method? Uh, I think that is, uh, you know, as you say, leading to the kind of pressure easily. Uh, and what are the negative, unforeseen circumstances of using technology like that, besides just doing it? Uh, so there are just uh, millions of questions, I think, built in. But perhaps in itself, uh, it, it is knowledge, it is true, what do we do with it? How do we use it? Uh, should we even pursue it? Uh, that, that's the major question. And, and I agree, of course, the, the issue here is, uh, can we call on human beings? Yeah, that, that's the, uh, the goal, the ultimate goal. Uh, as long as we're on the subject of cloning that, um, even though perhaps we've been talking about it before, it is for <laughs> We're into it anyhow, so why not? We'll get to topic four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, just to speak from what, what perhaps could be considered the Jewish point of view, even though since it's such a new field, the Jewish point of view hasn't really been formulated. It's something that came out effectively last week or, or something like that, so they haven't had time to sit down and think about what their position is going to be on it. So I'm, I'm kind of talking something to sense off the top of my head I'm, I'm in this response to the question. <laughs> but um, concerning cloning, which has, of course has major ethical problems with it, uh, there's another factor that, that comes into play in, in any, any ethical or religious view of it, which is that whatever laws, let's say, uh, Congress passes or some ethics committee or the religious community try to impose on the, the scientists, in a certain sense, are not going to make a bit of difference because um, if America, let's say, goes by these laws, which which I think is going to be a, a far, a pretty um, unlikely, unlikely scenario, being that 
You always have a private lab that don't have to answer to the government. They can do whatever they feel like. And in any case, there's other countries out there that, that have the knowledge. America does not have a monopoly on, on, on uh, biological knowledge. So um, the discovery itself came in uh, Scotland. So who would have expected Scotland to be the first country to, to pull this off? If anybody guessed, it probably would have been America. But there you go, it's, it's Scotland. And who knows how many countries out there that are capable of doing this? To the best of my understanding, the, uh, the original article that the cloning thing came in, in the Nature magazine, uh, was essentially uh, almost like a recipe for how to do it. And that anybody out there, if you've got the right equipment, which I, I think it's, the right equipment will, will be quite expensive, but if you have the right equipment, then you could do it yourself and start cloning sheep, and, and then uh, come up with chimpanzees, and, and who knows what's next. I, I think we all know what's next after, after chimpanzees. So uh, the, the ethical problem that anybody might bring up, that we should do this and we shouldn't do that, in a certain sense are irrelevant, in the sense that they're going to do it anyhow. Somebody out there, no matter what laws we come up with, and what, what regulations we come up with, and what advice we come up with, somebody out there is going to do it. So in my opinion, the real issue that uh, the, the ethical communities and the religious communities have to deal with is how are we going to deal with this thing in the worst case scenario? Because it, it, it's going to happen. The eugenics, uh, the problem with eugenics it, is going to happen out there. It's, I don't know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, whatever it is, when you can place an order for what type of child you want born, and then everybody seems to be streamlined along a certain line if that's, if that's the case. How is the world and the religious community is going, going to deal with that? Are we going to learn to live with it? Or are we going to go somehow find an island for ourselves to live on to get away from this thing? What are we going to do, what are we going to, do to deal with this sort of thing? I see it, and I, I believe the Jewish view on this would be to see it as somewhat of a reality. It's there in the same sense that, uh, that nuclear power and nuclear bombs are there, and we have to learn to, to live with these things in some capacity or other, and to use them in the proper manner. And that whatever laws we place on them are not going to matter to the, to the person next door who doesn't hold by the laws that I might come up with. <laughs> Incidentally, there's a, an example within Judaism of tampering with things that we shouldn't tamper with. It's the case of what's known in Hebrew as kilayim, which means the mixture of certain types of seeds, where you can't plant a grapevine so close to a, a vegetable or something like that. You can't mix certain things that shouldn't be mixed together. <laughs> so uh, it's forbidden, of course, where you can't plant a grapevine so close to a, a vegetable or something like that. You can't mix certain things that shouldn't be mixed together. <laughs> so uh, it's forbidden, of course, shouldn't get into. We really should not be tampering with this kind of stuff. But once it's out there, and once the rest of the world is using it, we also, we, the religious communities also have to learn to use this in ways that might be advantageous for them. Uh, with regard to, uh, to, the, to the clone, how then the question would come up, okay, we've done it. They've cloned a person. They've cloned a human being. Uh, the, it seems to me that the question for the, the uh, religious community then is how do we treat this clone, this human being? And then how do we then um, um, uh, exert influence and uh, um, force in the, com in the community about how we should treat that as a, as a real person and not as a, something for spare parts or as some somehow less than human. Uh, so I, I agree that, that uh, once these things are done, then you're in a different situation. Even though uh, you, know, you didn't, uh, and you would, you would uh, not want to be involved in the activity, once it's done, the product is there, uh, you're on a different, uh, a different level in the way that you treat these people. Then. And I think that, that the religious person always lives in tension with its culture, with uh, the world, the general world around them that, that uh, does not share their religious views, and in particular maybe in science that has, uh, you know, in, in some, to some degree has been uh, outside of religious space. I think, uh, you know, with this issue, again, going back to the, the way the Muslims would look at it is that everything, any newly introduced Thing into 
the uh, cultural milieu has to be looked at from the perspective of two things. One is benefit and the other is harm. Because the, the belief is that the Islamic law, the sacred law of Islam, is absolutely there for the benefit of human beings. It is for no other purpose. And this is by consensus of Muslim scholars that every law and injunction that God has given us, he has given us that law for our own benefit. And any prohibition, he has prohibited it because there is harm in it. Now, for instance, just to, to give an example of wine. In the Quran, it clearly says, in wine is benefit for people, but in it is harm. And its harm is greater than its benefit, so avoid it. Very simple, clear. So we have scientists now that tell us, you know, it's good to have a, a, a glass of wine uh, every night. Uh, you know, it actually lower your blood pressure. It'll prevent uh, uh, cardiac plaque and build up, and you'll have lower, higher HDL and 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 uh, give us all these scientific explanations. Well, you know, you're also going to have a lot of people that have cirrhosis of the liver and uh, are going to become alcoholics, and you're going to have tens of thousands of people die on the highways because of uh, drunk drivers, you're going to have lives that are ruined, you're going to have uh, child abuse, you're going to have uh, uh, pregnant uh, problems with women. Now we know just one little drink uh, can, can possibly harm the fetus of a child. So again, the Quran would say, yes, there, there is benefit in wine, but there is great harm. Now, uh, the cloning of sheep in Scotland, uh, you know, cash, cashmere sweaters might become very cheap, you know, and, and I happen to like cashmere sweaters, but I can't afford them, right? So, yeah, that, that's uh, beneficial, right? Not for the, the, the you know, the cashmere, uh, it's harmful for them, right? They're going to be a little kicked off if they get too many Scottish sheep up there being cloned, right? In fact, the Scottish cashmere lobby might, uh, you know, attempt to stop the process uh, from the beginning. But, again, what is the harm of this? And part of the harm, I mean, a good example of this is there is a very serious attempt at developing a, uh, an oil-eating uh, microbe uh, to clean up oil spills. This is a very serious attempt by, by scientists. And what their idea is that when there's an oil spill, we introduce the bacteria into the area, and boom, uh, they'll, they'll eat up all the oil. Well, wh what do they eat up after they finished with the oil spill? Right. Uh, another example is the, the killer bees. Now, a lot of people don't know that the killer bees was actually an experiment that, uh, that got out of hand down in South America, where perhaps they don't have as, as stringent laboratory conditions that they do in the Silicon Valley. Right. And uh, bees got out of a cross. There was a scientist literally crossing uh, African bees with, uh, with Brazilian bees, and some of them got away. And now we've got a killer bee problem, which is actually quite serious, and a lot of people are unaware of it. Another good example is the, the white, gross widespread use of uh, antibiotics in this country. It's just uh, phenomenal. We're having microbial changes going on in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the bacterial world that are phenomenal in, in relation to their impact on the human beings. We have harmless... Uh, now bacteria that were completely harmless in the 1940s that are causing most of the uh, nosocomial deaths in hospitals, like Pseudomonas, which is a bacteria that in the 1940s was innocuous, it was completely harmless bacteria, but it has mutated because of widespread use of penicillin to the point where it's killing thousands of people every year. So again, we have a human being that according to the Quran, وَمَا أُتِيْتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have given a, been given a very small amount of knowledge and yet we have this human being that is the hubris, I mean, wonderful Greek tragedies, right? It's always hubris that destroys the human being in Greek tragedies. And this is what human beings have, we have become so arrogant uh, in, in what we're doing in the world that we think that we can literally uh, do whatever we want with impunity without any fear of the repercussions of that. And uh, scientists uh, who, uh, in many cases, are deeply egotistical people that are really in search of the Nobel Prize, of uh, fame and glory, and will follow venues that will take them to... Uh, so we don't have the humble, uh, uh, pious individual who is seeking to understand the creation of God. We have an individual that literally wants to play God in his laboratory by creating a new form of life. Now the Quran very clearly says, 
ان الذين تدعون من دون الله ضرب الله ضرب للناس مثلا فاستمعوا له a an analogy has been uh, uh, struck for you human being so listen up it says literally listen attentively surely those you call upon beside god they cannot create a fly even if all of them came together to do it and if any life was taken from that fly they could not return that life to the fly how weak is the seeker and the sought. You see, now this uh, very clearly in the Quran, that there is some human impulse in mankind to want to, uh, the Promethean, right, the Promethean nature of man. I'm going to oppose God. I mean, Prometheus has sacrificed his, his liver being eaten out, uh, and, and Zeus has strapped him to a rock to suffer for giving knowledge to mankind, and he's boasting. I want mankind to rebel against the gods. And this again is this uh, satanic little character who comes in, he's the whisperer, right? He's the whisperer, go ahead, do it. You can do it. You see, in, in the modern world, people ask, why should we do it? Because it's doable. You see, this, as if this is some kind of ethical justification. No, we can do it. Why climb the mountain? To prove that we can do it. Why clone the sheep? To show that we can do it. Well, the Quran says, that when the earth brings forth all of its uh, riches and it becomes ornamented like the sky has become ornamented and which is interesting because satellite pictures now uh, show the earth looks literally like a galaxy because of the sky and it says and the inhabitants of the earth think that they're all powerful over it they think they've finally conquered nature and this again is part of this Greek uh, sickness that views nature as antagonistic to the human being because they believed that nature was, uh, they were embodiments of, of, of divine energies that were antagonistic with man. The Quranic worldview is that God has subjugated for you everything that's in the heavens and the earth. It is at your disposal. The Quran says that, uh, uh, that he that he has placed everything in the earth for your benefit and it's for your benefit including the cobra snake which can kill us but it's there because it's, it's there's something there's a wisdom there there's a tello as Aristotle would have it there's, there's a purpose in that creation and everything has purpose and so our goal is to be humble before God and before God's creation the Quran says that the servants of God are those who tread lightly on the earth. They tread lightly on the earth. Uh, what a beautiful description, tread, treading lightly on the earth. How grossly we're treading on the earth today. Literally, we're treading on it with bulldozers and with uh, bombs and with dynamite. We, we have no reverence for our own mother. You know, the Prophet Muhammad said, be vigilant about this earth because she's your mother. And just as the mother has rights of piety, so does this earth have rights of piety. You know, so I, I just think that we're really in a dangerous uh, predicament, and, and I don't fully accept this idea they're going to do it anyway. I mean, this is, for me, this is, you know, we can say, uh, you know, that, uh, well, uh, genocide is part of the human condition. They're always going to do it. No. There is no reason why there should be genocide. And when Islamic uh, law was being implemented in the world, you will not find any historical record of Muslims committing genocide against another people. You will not find it historically on the record, I guarantee you. And people will say, what about the Turks in Armenia? The Turks in Armenia were the young Turks, and they were very, very uh, distant from uh, Islamic sacred law by that time. The Muslims have always and it's not because we're ontologically better than people. It's not because we have some special status that we're chosen above other people. No, it's because we literally have parameters with which God has commanded us to stay and abide within. And if we abide within them, we are protected. When we transgress them, the Quran says, don't blame anybody but yourself when, when calamity strikes you. Um, let us not go uh, being uh, scientists too darkly <laughs> so that... Uh, uh, that a religious person, it's impossible for a religious person to be a scientist uh, uh, or even to be a, a doctor. Uh, certainly, as you say, uh, science can be used for good or for evil. And, uh, and much of it has been used, I think, for good. Uh, 
And I, I would not want uh, uh, I'm not, to yeah, think that. I'm not, com- yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not completely um, convinced of that. This much, I mean, this is the argument that science has put forward. And the argument that science has put forward is that religion is bad for people because it's left us in a superstitious state. And many scientists are deeply devoted to the destruction of, of religion. In fact, uh, the man Dawkins, who is a uh, very well-known evolutionist, just recently re- uh, he was awarded the Humanist of the Year Award, and in his acceptance speech said, you know, people uh, create organizations to destroy uh, the virus AIDS because it's so dangerous. And he said, what we need is an organization to destroy the virus of faith because this is the most dangerous thing uh, that, that is confronting the human uh, uh, animal, right? And, and and I think there are, are a lot of scientists that, that truly believe that, that religion needs to, that, you know, we were in the magical period, we've gone to the religious stage, and now we're in the rational scientific stage, and we need to just do away with all of this hogwash, really get rid of it. It has no realm, it's just uh, holding people up, and it's superstition. And this is in no way, I mean, that scientists are honored in the Islamic tradition, so I'm in no way intimating that science is, is not something new. Uh, the doctors, one of our greatest theologians, Imam Shafi, said that really knowledge is reduced to two things, knowledge of God and knowledge of medicine. Because one benefits the soul and the other benefits the body, and man is nothing other than body and soul. Uh, it's a beautiful articulation of that. So doctors have always been honored. Uh, scientists that enhance human life should be honored, but scientists that degrade human life, I have no place uh, in my heart for respect or dignity for them. We'll back up into our questions now. Uh, let's take topic three. Uh, this is about the sidebar and that discussion. How does your tradition uh, view? Um, uh, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution that comes up often in discussions of religion. And uh, so we'll, just, uh, we'll start out with the rabbi. Okay, this has been an uh, extremely big topic within uh, Judaism since Darwin came up with his theory, specifically the last about 30 years or so, it's been a very hot topic. By and large, most Orthodox Jews will take a position of wholeheartedly rejecting Darwin's theory of evolution because it comes into such blatant conflict with the Torah. So the viewpoint that I'm going to put forth is not necessarily that of the bulk of the Jewish scholars out there. It's, it's my own viewpoint, and I would label it a minority viewpoint within Orthodox Judaism that Darwin came up with a theory that species evolve. They evolve due to elements of competition and certain genetic elements get in there that, that place monkey wrenches into the whole thing. And, and after billions of years or so, it's a new species is formed. So Darwin, uh, I don't recall which creatures he came up with the theory on, but some some sort of uh, roses or something like that in, in an island, South Pacific Island. <coughs> and he expanded the theory to include human beings. The Jewish view on, on the Jews that I believe uh, concerning Darwin would be the following. That everything Darwin said as far as natural selection and the whole world, the Torah would have no problem with. Every single thing that Darwin said, with, with one exception, the Torah could fit in perfectly. That there is some sort of evolution out there, the, the, the universe, the world, creation, is all heading towards a specific goal. And evolution is, in a certain sense, the, the natural form of, of being led along that path. <coughs> the problem comes up when you throw human beings into the equation. And the, the conclusion, the logical conclusion that Darwin came to, which I believe most scientists would come to the same conclusion, most biologists certainly have come to this conclusion, is that human beings are no exception. And that human beings, just like frogs came from some earlier amphibian, and, and that early amphibian came from something else, and so on down the line. So human beings, the logical thing to say is human beings came from apes. 
or a human being who's an ape had some sort of common ancestor, some, I don't know what it might have been, but some chimpanzee or any kind of looking thing back in Africa, some sort of common ancestor, and the conclusion that comes to from that is we are really nothing other than a fairly advanced and uh, intelligent form of an animal, which is the view that's promoted almost universally, almost universally in universities and in the scientific world in general. So this is the part where uh, the Torah would have major problems with it. The Torah would view evolution not necessarily in conflict with the Torah, but the Torah would say evolution is certainly possible, but evolution was, was, was not a random process that just kind of happens. And, and that's the way it is. It's totally by chance. Some sort of molecules, they, 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 by random, who knows what, they start to mutate and, and then a new species is formed over millions of years. No, it's not looked at as a random process. It's looked at as a process which is guided by God. And this is God's method of, in a certain sense, sticking God's hand into the world and leading it along a certain path. And all, all of the species on the earth are guided by this unseen hand in the form of evolution. When it comes to human beings, a big exception is made. This exception is made quite blatantly, because it's quite, quite, quite uh, obviously in the Torah itself, where it says that when God created human beings, he created them in an extremely unique manner from the creation of all other creatures. He breathed into them a living soul, and he created them in his image. So all of these things depict the idea of saying that Human beings, even though their body, the body that we have, bears a striking resemblance to that of age. And even though it's possible to say that the human body is evolved from the body of some sort of uh, ape-like creature, that would not necessarily be any sort of conflict with, with religion. But when it comes to the other facets of the human being, the human facet of the human being, namely the soul, that's where Judaism would take issue with science and say, if you're going to leave out the soul and say that we're nothing but a smart chimpanzee, that's where we got problems with it. You have to say that God in some way had some sort of uh, extreme uh, hand in the creation of human beings, and that, for lack of a better word, that within human beings a soul that resembles in some way the image of God. So evolution, by and large, we could fit the whole thing in there. God guided the evolution so that the dinosaurs would appear, this would appear, and this would evolve into that, whatever the fruit flies do, whatever fruit flies are supposed to do. Human beings, whether they evolve or make, no problem if they did or not, except for the spiritual element, the divine element of the human being, that in no way came from any other animal. The element of free will, the element of the ability to recognize ourselves, awareness of God, awareness of our role in creation, that is not a product of evolution. No matter what Darwin or anybody or the Dawkins or any of other people say, that is not a product of evolution. That is a product of the hand of God. Uh, whenever this question of evolution comes up, I'm always uh, reminded of a uh, song that I heard in a, in a, uh, a movie. Uh, that was showing various churches in America, and one church was a um, an evangelical church, and this young group was singing a song, and the song went something like this: "I ain't no kin to the monkey, and the monkey's no kin to me. I certainly didn't swing from no tree." Uh, and certainly, in the you know the the, the long history of Christianity, uh, and even since the, the, the Darwin theory. Uh, there's been antagonism toward it, and there has been, you know, maybe more of a, a rapprochement, uh, uh, something similar to uh, what Rabbi Meyer is talking about. Uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, Pope uh, John Paul, in his address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, uh, said that evolution is more than a theory and account and can account for the physical dimensions of human life, which is pretty much what uh, Rabbi Meyer was saying. Uh, but cannot account for it, the uh, spiritual aspect of, of being human. Uh, science doesn't address that question. It's not that, that it, it doesn't have the tools to talk about uh, human spirituality. That isn't what it uh, is meant to do. Um, the Jesuit uh, Pierre Pierre de Chardin uh, 
uh, in the early part of this century uh, tried to reconcile some of that tension that was uh, very prominent in the early part of the century between science, particularly evolution, and uh, Christianity and Catholic beliefs. And he uh, looked at evolution and he, and he said, well, what do I see? I see from the moment of the Big Bang uh, a direction, uh, a thrust toward something. And the something that the, the thrust is toward is consciousness. He sees that there is a law of complexity consciousness at work in the universe. As we, uh, um, as uh, things become more and more complex, that is, more and more uh, individual things working together for the good of one, there is uh, inevitably a march towards greater and greater consciousness until we arrive at the, uh, the human consciousness. Uh, um, what uh, Teilhard sees then is a, a, a geosphere the sphere of the earth, a biosphere, a sphere of life itself, where there is a quantum jump from uh, inanimate uh, things to, uh, to life itself, and then an enormous jump to what he calls the nautical sphere, the uh, whole realm of the human mind and the human spirit. And he says, well, look, as a scientist, I see this direction. Where are we going? Is evolution stopped? And he, he would say, no, this law of complexity consciousness is put in the universe by God. And the movement on the next level of evolution is similar to all those that went on before. It is now a drawing together of all these minds, all these human spirits and souls into unity, into one. Uh, this is his uh, vision, his religious vision and dream, and uh, perhaps something that uh, we uh, are moving forward in a tiny, tiny bit by our conversation this evening. Uh, I, I'm always fascinated by uh, capitulation to, to evolution uh, on the part of religious practitioners because I think that probably uh, no other idea is, is more antithetical to the religious traditions than, than the idea of, of, uh, of evolution as it's understood by neo-Darwinists or Darwinists. I think that uh, every spiritual tradition, Martin Ling said that every spiritual tradition teaches the evolution, not evolution, that people are actually getting worse, uh, not getting better. And this would be the idea in most traditions of, uh, you know, uh, Adam, and then the, the, the fall of man, that, that man has fallen from, from, from uh, you know, from, from paradise, from the garden. And then what needs to take place in each generation is a spiritual evolution, which is vertical, not uh, horizontal. It is a move back to God. And this is the challenge of, of every uh, human generation. Uh, in terms of, of looking at uh, the idea of evolution, I think it's important to look at it in the historical context. I don't feel qualified. I think what we would need to have somebody that really could articulate uh, this, this talk. And it's unfortunate this thing's been going on for over 100 years. Uh, it really has. It's absurd almost. That the, the, but there are other religious arguments that went on for several hundred years before they were finally kind of ironed out. Uh, and, and that's why I can wait, you know, it might not be in my lifetime, but as a human being, I'm willing to wait because I just, you know, given the nature of, say, Thomas Kuhn's idea of the theory of uh, scientific revolution, is that a theory is, is postulated and then anomalies arise. And those anomalies are either dealt with by the theory or they result in a tension within the scientific community that necessitates a new theory to deal with the anomalies and then anomalies arise again. So within the scientific community, I mean, you could see quite clearly that each generation of scientists believes that they are at the cutting edge of truth. Uh, the, the 19th century physicians uh, that were leeching people and bleeding people to death were actually the men of science of their age. I mean, they believed that, that this was the most advanced thing that they could do. 
and yet a, a modern physician who looks at that is, is in deep shock at the stupidity of it. Uh, well, I think probably 100 years from now, if there are physicians around, they'll be deep, in deep shock about the stupidity of, of 20, late 20th century physicians as well. So this is the nature of the scientific community. It's always looking at the previous generation and amazed at the things that they've come up with. And I think that Darwinism is another, it's another one of these things that will fall by the wayside. I really do. And I don't think, well, just to look at it from a philosophical point of view, uh, the assumption with Darwinism is the idea of continuity. The continuity needs to be explained. Well, this is a Newtonian worldview because Darwin was living in the world of Newton. When you get into quantum mechanics, which is where we are in the 20th century, uh, in fact, continuity is not the assumption, it's discontinuity. So you could look at evolution, or you could look at the beginning of life and the human condition from the perspective of discontinuity, as opposed to continuity, and then you have a whole other problem. And you can arrive at a completely different interpretation of how we, uh, how we got to where we are and where we came from. Uh, because uh, quantum physics allows for spontaneous emergence. And for the, the Muslims, uh, there is spontaneous emergence in creation. That there is a point when God says, kun fayar kun, be and it is. Simple as that. So we do believe in spontaneous and immediate generation of, of life. And we have no problems with that. And Muslims won't, and I, I don't think any uh, Muslims who understand the Quran will capitulate to that because we believe that Adam was a prophet. And if you, if you think that Adam is some kind of mythical figure or theoretical uh, mythical truth that's being presented, as many, many Christians believe now, uh, from a Muslim perspective, you are outside of the pale of Islam. So for the Muslim, uh, the idea that we began as uh, a, a unicellular, uh, I mean, it's, it's just uh, very difficult for the Muslims. We, we don't accept the idea that life simply began and it's moving and that there's this thing called uh, uh, nature, right, which is the scientist's word for God. I mean, if you take nature and, and put it into most scientific books, a lot of uh, uh, believers wouldn't really have a problem with the book, but scientists are deeply embarrassed of the word nature, and this is the uh, word God, which is related to the historical context which Darwin was in. If you look, uh, Darwin was a man deeply influenced by a philosopher named David Hume, and David Hume did not believe that there should be any religious explanation for anything in, in, in existence. He, did, he felt that miracles, there's no place for miracles in science. So let's not explain things through miracles. Let's explain things through what we can see, feel, and touch. And this is part of the 19th century attempt in, in science, is to explain things by removing God completely from the picture and then see what we come up with. Well, if you remove God from the picture, yes, you will come up with theories like evolution. But that does not mean that God is removed from the picture. You know, it's like the, the, the graffiti says, you know, Nietzsche, God is dead, quote, Nietzsche. Then 1900, Nietzsche is dead, quote, God. I mean, God is not some, uh, some thing that we can just brush aside for the Muslim. No, God he is truly in God's own reality. And we have to listen to what God says and not listen to what our own egos and what our own, uh, those who want to literally dethrone God from his majestic place of authority in the universe. And God for us is the creator, the fashioner. The Quran says, al Khadiq, al Baat, al Musawwa. He is the creator, the originator, and the fashioner. That God fashions creation. And we believe the Prophet Muhammad once saw a man, he was boxing with another man, and he said, avoid the face, because he was created, Adam was created on the same form. Now this is a clear reputation in our own tradition that the first man was created in his own form. Adam It's very clear in the Arabic language. And we cannot, given that our prophet has said that, either uh, the, the prophet is, is, is uh, as many people would say, he's uh, a, a, either a well-intentioned person who's invented this thing, or uh, he's a well-intentioned person who's made this thing, or he's a prophet from God. If he's a prophet from God, then we have to accept that what he's telling us is truth, and it's not metaphorical. So we literally believe that, yes, God did create. Now, if you want to say, well, how do you explain uh, Lucy, which uh, is... Uh, a skeleton that was found 60% um, intact 
uh, with nominal features and eight features and is seen as a transitional uh, uh, skeleton between the eighth period and the man. Well, the, the Quran says that, that God in fact created eight from men. The Quran says that God said to certain people that transgress so greatly, Kunu, Karadan, wa Khanazir, the eight and six. And the traditional Muslim interpretation is transmogrification. It literally took place. And Ibn al-Arabi, the great uh, uh, exegete, was of the belief that, uh, that, that they still continue to procreate. In other words, that there are apes that are actually descendants of humans and not humans that are descendants of apes. And, and this is something that wasn't for you. We actually believe it. We're, I'm not ashamed of my, I don't need to uh, harmonize my uh, beliefs with whatever the latest scientific fad is. You know, because each generation is going to come along with the latest theory, and then I have to rework all of my theology and rework, I mean, either it's true or it's not true. Now, part of the interesting thing is that somebody who has entered into the Islamic state, I was, I was not raised in Muslim, but somebody who's come into the state, I am either going to accept the thing and then restructure my own beliefs around the beliefs of Islam, or I am going to come into the faith with my own preconceived beliefs and notions and reconstruct my, my faith according to whatever my preconceived beliefs were. So if I'm a scientist, then I can only be a Christian if my Christianity is in complete harmony with whatever the latest scientific uh, theories are and things like that. No. No, I, I, I can't accept that. My faith is either true or it's not true. If it is true, it is consistent with the truth. Now to say, well, it can be interpreted metaphorically, where do you stop? Where do you stop? Once we allow metaphor and allegory to come in, because the Quran very clearly says, some of the verses of this book are metaphorical and others are clear. And as for the metaphorical ones, those who have deviation in their hearts, follow them. And as for those who are firmly rooted in knowledge, they follow the clear signs. So once you start uh, turning all of your book and tradition into metaphorical signs, that is a sign of deviation in the heart. That the heart is now uh, interpreting uh, the book according to one's passions, according to one's own desires. So the Muslim, I mean, we have to say, uh, no, we, we and we don't, and interestingly enough, in Europe, Darwinism is literally on its way out. It's very strong in America because it's become ide at the ideological level. It's taught as ideology. It is taught as fact. It is not a fact. It is a theory. It is a theory. It is called the theory of evolution. And the theory can sound great. Lots of theories did. The, the, a lot of people don't believe the poor humoral theory of, of medicine anymore. But at the time that it was taught, if, if you were a scientist, you had to believe in it. And uh, the great uh, physician um, in Europe, uh, who, who actually burnt uh, the book of Hippocrates was considered a complete heretic at that time. Uh, his name's not coming to me. He's very well known. And he wanted to abandon the tradition of the old and say, no, we have to uh, go on. So uh, Hippocrates was a theorist. And some of his theories are correct and others are wrong. But the, one of the sicknesses of uh, Western civilization was it took these authorities as absolute truth, and when these authorities were completely turned upside down, it becomes iconoclastic against all authority. And this is where we're at now. I mean, we, we attack all authority, but really what we're t attacking most often is the authority of, of tradition. And what we celebrate and what we exalt ourselves in is whatever the dominant thing now. We're in the modern world. It's here and now. Forget the past. And Islam says, no, we honor the past. We honor the past. And Islam says that the past has great wisdom to impart to us. And what modern uh, Western uh, tradition is saying, no, the past is something, let's just discard it. Let's get rid of it. So I think, uh, really, uh, it's very unfortunate that um, so many of the religious... Uh, and just to make myself perfectly clear here, I don't in any way agree with uh, the, what is known as the fundamentalist Christian position, which is called scientific creationism. I do not believe in that at all, and I think it's actually quite absurd. And I think I would have a very difficult time in my faith if my faith taught me that the earth was 6,000 years old. 
uh, my faith does not teach me that. The Quran says that God created the heavens and earth in six days. And it says, وَمَا مَسَنَ مِنْ لُغُوبِ And we didn't get tired. <laughs> in other words, God doesn't get worn out from doing... Uh, if God is either all-powerful or he's not. I mean, if he gets tired, we're, we're in bad shape. Right? Because maybe he'll get tired of putting up with our arrogance. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, um, move in the direction of religious arrogance, though. Uh, let us recall the, 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 the sins of very religious people uh, who claim to be uh, going along the ways of religious truth and, and following long, long religious traditions uh, when they sanctioned slavery over the centuries. Uh, I think that perhaps all of our traditions have done that and certainly engaged in. Uh, owning human beings and treating them as something uh, less than human. Uh, This uh, uh, idea of the dignity of of all human beings took us a while to get straight. And so I think our religious truths also developed, or certainly our theology developed, our understanding of what the text means uh, uh, developed. I'm not sure that we, we have complete, absolute control and understanding of the text from the very beginning, uh, I think our understanding develops. Uh, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, uh, we'll mention um, that uh, uh, the, Islamic, the Islamic view is not really going with regard to theory because of the fact that God is the creator and God is, is the the, I believe the word used was the uh, fastener, I think, some fashioner, fashioner, fashioner so well. of everything. Um, what I'm not clear about is, uh, is two things. One, I'm not sure what is the conflict between God being the creator and the fashioner mm-hmm. and evolution. Okay. Number one. And number two is, is there anything specifically in the Quran itself that precludes the theory of evolution? Absolutely. And my point was is that when we say that we believe in Adam as the first human being and, and his uh, companion uh, Hawa or Eve, uh, we believe that they were created in that form. In other words, that, uh, they were, that God created them in that form. They were created in the form of man, and it is a dignified form. It is not, an, uh, it, it is not a, a form that... Uh, is is uh, that denigrates man? In fact, the Quran says, "Laqad karamna bani Adam." We have honored bani Adam, and and one of the interpretations traditionally is that bani Adam walks upright. Uh, one of the interpretations is that bani Adam was given an opposable thumb. That is actually a classical interpretation that the human being can have, that God has given us the ability to use our hands in ways that animals don't have. So we believe that this form that we are on is the form of Adam. And the prophet told us that the first human being was Adam. And Adam had this form. He did not have the form uh, of, uh, of an animal. He had the form of a human being, which, yes, there are aspects that we share with animals, but we are not a, a, an animal. We are called, in fact, the Arab, uh, Arabic or the Muslim theologians called us hayawan nafiq a speaking animal, uh, which, the, which is very different from rational animal in, in the Western sense, but a speaking animal is that God has honored us with speech, with the ability to speak. And, and I think our difficulty with uh, evolution is that evolution, again, at, at its most fundamental level, is eliminating the creator. And I think a lot of people miss this point, although there are biologists who are Christians, there are biologists uh, who are Jewish and, and might believe that God, yes, God is moving uh, in mysterious ways. The, the Pope just recently announced that uh, natural selection was one of the ways that God uh, works in his creation. Uh, for the, 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 the evolutionist who is really, really deeply rooted in evolution, th- this is kind of absurd because they actually feel that uh, there is random selection going on. In other words, there's trial and error. And this is something really important within evolutionary theory. You have to believe in the concept of trial and error, that, that God is somehow not really, a, 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 he's not a perfect creator. You know, he's, he's messing around. He's, you know, in fact, I saw a cartoon once of the dinosaurs 
and, uh, and there was a cloud up there and a voice coming out of the cloud saying, cool, and it said, God as an adolescent, right? And this is the kind of idea that I think a lot of uh, evolutionists uh, have, that somehow, you know, we, the, the Quran says, uh, ahsan al uh, blessed is God, the best of creators, the most perfect of creators. And then it says quite clearly in the Quran, خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِأَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created the human being in the best stature. Now, khalq itself is the creation. We believe that, and, and it says in the Quran, that, that Adam السلام, was fashioned by God that God formed Adam. And so this idea that, you know, we're moving from a unicellular, and again, like De Chardin, who I think uh, has some really uh, dangerous ideas in terms of, of uh, classical theology, uh, and one of the ideas is this idea that we're moving towards perfection, this noosphere, and, and one of his ideas is that, that Christ actually came at a point where we had reached in our evolution, and his second coming would be at a point where we we're at a higher stage of evolution, which I think is... is very, very antithetical to a traditional theological position that, w- that is that we in fact are moving down, that things are getting worse, that Christ returns when there's uh, wars and rumors of wars and famines and false prophets and, and all the rest, that, that the human beings actually are in a much worse condition now than they were uh, a thousand years ago or two thousand. From a Muslim perspective, I'm speaking as a Muslim, we believe that we are getting worse. We are not getting better. And evolution is based on this idea of progress that we are moving towards a better state. No, the, 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 the Islamic position is very clear. We are moving down. And that the end of the human being is complete uh, degradation. That this is the final state of the last people on earth. And the Prophet Muhammad said, the end of time will not come until no one is left to say, God, God. And he said, and the end of time will not come except upon the worst people, the worst human beings. And we can see now in, in modern uh, America, you know, when pornography is, is the number one media in this country, when human beings have reached a level of human degradation that was beyond the pale for classical people, really. I mean, just uh, extraordinary state of affairs, all of the exploitation that's going on in the world. I would contest that there is more slavery and bondage now than there ever has been in the history of human societies. I would contest that the grossest and, and greatest abuses of, of human beings are taking place in uh, all over the world. You go down to South America, you go to Africa, and, and look. And many of these places are places that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the so-called religious people of those places, speaking about religious righteousness, uh, are advisors uh, in the government and things like this. So I, I have no uh, you know, religious people or self-righteousness or religious uh, uh, self-righteousness. I mean, this is one of the age-old diseases of the human being, you know, waxing self-righteous about his own religiosity, right? And it's certainly a, a terrible state to be in, really. So I, you know, I think that that is really at the crux of it. It's so, so the Islamic view, uh, this is the Islamic view essentially, <coughs> is that things are, are going to just keep on getting worse. Basically. Boom. We're heading down, and it's going fast. And one of the interesting things, right, if you think about it, you know, one of the modern phenomenon is speed. Everything's speeding up. We're all experiencing. Well, speed is a downward motion. It's not an upward motion. As things move up, they actually slow down, right? So when human beings are moving up, things slow down. We start becoming more tranquil, more content. No, people are becoming more anxious. They're becoming more wired, right? I mean, we, we don't, we're not content with 286. We want 386. Now we want 486. Now we want Pentium. Now we want people, now this computer's too slow. You know, this, why can't this uh, fax machine work faster? What's going on? I mean, this is, and the Prophet Muhammad said, and I get it to him in Speed is from Satan. You know, so we would say that the ancient, the very, very ancient people, Abraham, was deeply, deeply uh, spiritually evolved individual. He lived in a tent, according to the Islamic tradition. And yet we believe that he was probably one of the most enlightened and uh, uh, spiritually aware human beings that has ever existed. He was also interested in how life began according to the Quran because he asked God, show me how you bring life from the dead. And God says, don't you believe, Abraham? And Abraham says to him in the Quran, I believe, but in order to give some stillness to my heart, I want to witness it. And God showed him how he brought uh, something from uh, dead, inanimate, to life. 
So he was a scientist from a Muslim perspective. Abraham was a scientist, but he was a scientist that wanted his science to increase his faith, to increase his closeness to God. And, and what I see happening in the, in the modern world is that science is distancing us from God. It is a false prophet. And I believe in many ways that, that science now is in fact uh, it is a type of antichrist. That, that, that it is a false god, and people have taken it as a false god, and it promises, it promises us salvation, and it will betray us in the end, and it might well be our, our, our destruction. Um, in terms of that, the bulk of what you said there, uh, I, I...